Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, for being here. For those of you who um, um, who haven't attended one of the now series semester, this is the third and the last one of the nows uh, for this semester. As you know, we've been trying to uh, somehow more broadly deal with issues around science and technology uh, this semester. Uh, in distinction to last semester, which was more about art. Um, uh, we had, uh, we had um, uh, Professor Mahadevan, who is uh, from, from, uh, from mathematics and biology here, um, and Achim Menges, and uh, so I'm very happy that, that your concept is here today. York has been here already for a few days. Some of you have already seen or heard him in a, in a class or in a review. Uh, York was uh, just recently at the Venice Biennale where he was uh, basically invited to be the representative of Switzerland uh, and uh, had uh, the Swiss pavilion. Um, he worked together with a photographer to really look at this relationship between landscape and, and structures in Switzerland. And uh, this is the book that came from uh, the Venice Biennale. Uh, he actually commissioned a photographer, Martin Lenzi, to go around with him and to photograph uh, uh, a, a great number of structures. Uh, Jörg and I are friends, and we have known each other for a long time. And we actually made this, uh, this book called Structure as Space together is something that I made and I would recommend that you, you look at it uh, if you don't know this book. Uh, I was very interested in, in York's work because uh, York was, when we started working, this is many, many years ago now, uh, very unusual in that um, his office is not really an office that's just set up to simply you know, service, if you like, architectural practices. Of course, he does that. But he operates as a structural uh, bridges, and he has done some incredibly beautiful, especially foot bridges uh, in, uh, in Switzerland that, that you will now see. Uh, and these bridges are always in very, very special relationship to landscape. So it's, it's not that we're really dealing only with the discussion of structure, but we're really dealing with this relationship between structure and site. Uh, he's also worked uh, very closely with a number of uh, architects um, and is now, for example, working with, uh, with uh, Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Moron, but that's more recent. He actually works in the context of a very special town in Switzerland called Kur, uh, which is in the Graubunden area. This is also a very special part of Switzerland and has many uh, interesting architects who, who work in this, uh, in this area. So there's something of a kind of local uh, situation, which I think is important, and perhaps he, he might say something about that. Uh, so one was the relationship to landscape. Another is really the specific relationship to architectural practices. I can, I can you know, talk for a long time about the importance of, of the work. I would say one of the key things also that really excited me about the work was was uh, was York's interest in the in the relationship between engineering and infrastructure more broadly, and the idea that infrastructure is not something which is simply a kind of technical thing, part of technical knowledge. Um, but I personally was very interested in the way in which uh, the Swiss were very um, clear about the way in which they related the construction of their infrastructure to questions of identity and identity formation. Uh, therefore, um, for example, the notion of tourism, the idea of the Alps, the notion of the views of these, of these landscapes, they became a very important part of the way in which infrastructure was conceived. It wasn't simply an idea of constructing infrastructures so that people could get from A to B. It served that, but it also is a very significant part of how you really set up the notion of the, the, the construction of the specific view of this uh, landscape, which is really, if you like, a kind of notion of, of Swissness in, in some sense, which, which other countries in Europe that also have the Alps 
don't do the same thing, didn't do the same thing as the Swiss, in a way. So this is a very interesting thing in terms of the relationship between engineering and really much broader uh, cultural issues that, uh, that Jörg has been uh, very much interested, uh, interested in. So um, we're looking forward to, uh, to Jörg's presentation. I've also asked him to do something different than what we do in the now presentations where we always ask people to talk very briefly for 20 minutes uh, and now I've asked him to actually speak longer so that this is almost like a mini lecture with a shorter period for questions. Uh, but I, I think that we're all in for a treat, so please welcome your concert. Thank you. Enjoy your meal. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Moisen for this friendly introduction. As he said, I was surprisingly called a year ago to make this contribution for the Architectural Biennale in Venice. The uh, surprise was big, and I spontaneously said, yes, of course, I want to do that. My mind is still full of these impressions, and I would like to start with some presentations about this work I did for Venice. <coughs> Actually, there was some difficulty in translation. I had the idea to make a exhibition called Landschaft und Kunstbauten, which literally means landscape and art works. And I realized only then that Kunstbauten, even the Germans, do not understand in the Swiss sense for bridges, tunnels, retaining walls, infrastructural services. And the second difficulty was I had the idea to follow that concept of my friend Walter Czocke, who wrote a lot about Swiss Alpine roads and considered them as promenade architectural through a number of Geländekammern, which also literally means uh, compartment of the landscape, so that following such a road, you cross like rooms. And we thought to build this exhibition also in that sort of rooms to present Kunstbauten from a special room in an exhibition room. So this <coughs> is the entrance to the Swiss Pavilion, built by Bruno Giacometti, architect, brother of Alberto, still alive, 102 years old. Yeah. And this is just an impression out from this exhibition with this Kammern system. Martin Lindsay, the photographer, and I spent 45 days making photographs. We always work together, and he is a slow photographer with a big camera, at least one hour per picture. And this gave the opportunity to work on the site. I had my laptop with me, I made the texts on the site, we discussed before taking the photographs, and this was a very special way of work, which I enjoyed a lot, because I usually enjoy go outside, make investigations of engineering works, make surveys, and I think we have the books about theory. We have the mind, the spirit. But we also, also have, like the book, outside, the physical reality. And we should not forget to study this larger field of experience to complete our knowledge gained from studies, from books. We did not proceed in a very systematical way because 
actually we wanted to explore things. You cannot explore things when you already know what you want to do. And we discovered also a lot of aspects which I want to tell you about. For example, this graciously curved bridge dates 1545. The masonry is unchanged since then. You see two arches, one above the other. What is the reason for that? We don't know, but I can think that they first built one arch to save costs for the scaffolding, and then added the second arch, which did not load the temporary structure, because the first arch was already there, a principle that Robert Meyer used 400 years later. Look, this superfluous tunnel, this is concept of an attitude towards the landscape to build short tunnels, even if it would have been easier to make a cutting, but it's the will to leave this crest uninterrupted. This is a commitment towards landscape. Calm plain formed with artificial dams. <coughs> and then, one surprising fact, the rehabilitation of bridge building of the 1970s. You may call that a crude bridge, but <coughs> these spans of 90 meters, you stand there and suddenly you realize this is not at all economical. The economical demand would have led to half the span. So why do this extra expense? It's a tribute to the landscape. <coughs> the bridge wants to frame the landscape. And even if you may lack a sense of detailing, I think this is a pair of bridges. It's not just one bridge beside the other for a highway. I think there is a sense of proportion in this artwork. And <coughs> being there for two or three hours, yeah. it really made us be fascinated by this seemingly so simple and crude structure. And just let me make a short interruption to illustrate the today's situation in Swiss bridge building. I just show you a competition entry we did for this Steinbach viaduct. It's an artificial lake near Einsiedeln, an existing bridge, which is too small, too light, must be replaced. It's a touristic region, with a lot of traffic. So our proposal was a bridge with a continuous girder and increasing spans towards the middle. It starts with 25 meter spans, and it ends with 55 meter spans in the middle of the lake. The lake is shallow, 10 meters. But you don't see that. <laughs> and in our opinion, this was a relationship to the different scales of the landscape, of the lakeside at the beginning and the end, to the mountains in the middle. <coughs> and yeah, we liked this design a lot. Of course, we cared about detailing, but the detailing was in service of the overall concept. 
it was a deception to see the winning project, which was intelligent, cheap, and banal. <laughs> <laughs> it rose a public discussion, because I wanted to express that. And finally, they invited me to say, look, we did such a lot of care, the architect especially of this bridge, and showed like he sculptured these pillars. And I said, OK, that's, that's all right. But <coughs> it's not dealing with the main thing. It's not coming towards the concept of the bridge. And this is, this is embellishment of standardized structures. And that's not what is my interest. So this was also one reason which made me both, uh, which made me fond of these 70s structures. Another thing, one of the first railway bridges in the Jura Mountains south of Basel, here it's not the question of big spans or the notion of transparency so stressed in contemporary bridge building. I think this bridge is like a house. It's a building at the side of the village. And so the ornamentation of this bridge is another thing as what we have seen before. Because when you build a house, you look for the appropriate ornamentation. And that is what happened here. I think it's interesting also today to think from time to time, should the bridge frame the landscape, as we have seen, or should it be housed? This bridge really is a house. It's the public path at Bellinzona. The bridge serves a foot path from the town to the River Ticino. It's public connection. And under the bridge, there are the infrastructures of the, of the bath. You can enter the bath down the stairs from the bridge. So very intelligent solution. Of course, the great ancient wooden bridges, also the bridge as a house. You like to rest on such a bridge. It's not <coughs> only a means of transport or of crossing. This is a bridge of Robert Maillard, but at the moment you don't find this such of such an importance. You have a view to the skyline of the city of Arburg. Again, a slightly descending bridge which offers a monumental view towards the town of St. Gallen. The bridge as a viewpoint I try to exploit these characteristics in the new bridge at Fals. The bridge is orientated directly to the central <coughs> square of the village. It's a bridge made of the local stone, and the stone is load-bearing. <coughs> and I could talk a lot about the structural actions of this compound system. But first, I want to emphasize the important thing about this bridge is its location. It becomes part of the public space of this village by its situation. What I told until now <coughs> was were things which come before calculations, before <coughs> the real structural thing. And again, I would 
show you another example how the main task was finding the goal of the work which should be done. So it's an enclosure for apes. These are our clients here. <laughs> <laughs> there is an existing ape house built not by an architect but by a sculpture, Kurt Brecker. And this is a very interesting house. He had ideas like never come to an ape's apartment on a direct way. By using these 60 degrees angles, you always move somehow tangentially towards these ape apartments. But as you see, the outside regions here, here, they are very small. And the zoo wants to improve the situation, to enlarge <coughs> these outside areas. And so we were called to design these. <laughs> I tried for once to use a very methodical way. So I made sketches, I made texts. And what you see now is maybe the work of one hour. I just translated my handwritten notes. Uh, it's German, but I can also translate that. But it's really the, the process how it was. So I started with the idea of just a skeleton building and using the mesh diagonally as a stiffener of the building. But think about these apes, 200 kilo per gorilla, uh, and they like to move things. So <laughs> I didn't <laughs> want to build uh, a thing which will be set in motion by the apes. Uh, so we changed the idea to have a stiff diagonal system where the mesh serves only as an infill. But it looked, it looked wrong. It looked wrong in scale. It, it was too constrained, not appropriate. So I changed to a macro structure to say, make a few very strong elements out of it like frames, pillars, girders, rafters. But then why do you need rafters? It's not a house. You have this mesh, leave this away. But then you have a horizontal tension force coming out from the mesh. So it makes sense to incline the outer girders and to anchor this mesh vertically downwards. But we have avoided the rafters. Why do you need these girders? You can carry the mesh in different points. So finally, you have like fingers. You could do these fingers out of concrete. So this is a stiff element which cannot be set in vibration by the apes. And then I had the feeling uh, <coughs> that's something that works. We have come to an end. So we had to precise the concept. We started to think maybe the apes would like these rounded areas like seats, or they would like to climb up, or you could even think that these are like concrete bushes or things like that. But I want, wanted to show you that it's not, this is not the important thing. Primarily, it's a structure. And as a structure, I think it has its force. 
and it's not so important if the apes really want to sit in it. I'm happy if they do, but this is not the most important thing, and also not this allegory towards nature. So then I started to calculate, and then we started to build models, test the <coughs> position of these elements. So there was a lot of work <coughs> before <coughs> the so-called classical engineering work. And I asked myself, if you need an engineer for doing that, I think you as an architect could have done it more or less the same way if you are interested <coughs> in the physical properties, <coughs> in a certain sense of appropriateness, which you also need to have. And so maybe this phase of the work <coughs> is not so different from yours. Back to the Biennale exhibition. We saw a bridge built by Fritz Stüssi, an eminent steel engineer. It's in Zürich, an underpass of a road. Uh, we like that thing because after a while it started to be really rational. Think that the lake of Zurich is higher than the deepest point of the road. So we are inside the groundwater. So there is a concrete trough where the road leads through. And there was a high interest to make the railway bridge as thin as possible. And Stussi used the walkways on both sides of the road to introduce short side spans where he could use the abutment like a counterweight to diminish the moments in the central span. So you can see here this is a tension element. Yeah, here you see that. And by this element, this relief of the central span is achieved. And it's a work of very high rationality, but it has something appealing, not the least also due to the very careful surface treatment of the concrete. <coughs> and it happened that about four weeks ago, I was called by an old engineer to meet him with another object of Stussi, this is a war bridge. He constructed it in the 1930s, on the beginning of the Second World War, for the army. And of course, there is nothing about landscape. There is nothing about surrounding. There is nothing about feeling of spectators. Uh, but this old engineer, he was <coughs> so taken so fond of this bridge that he passed me all the documents and said I, have, I should take care to these things. And I also got touched by this work because Stussi, he reinvented even the screws for this bridge. The screw is broader on one side that you can introduce it to these precisely drilled holes. And the nut is at first smooth inside that you have a longer distance to tighten the screw, which acts a little bit like a spring. Finally, you have a better performance by pre-stressing the screw. And 
I mean, in a certain way, this is like Cartesian. You have to doubt about all around you. But you have to reinvent things. <coughs> and this happens on an infinitesimal scale first. <coughs> I mean, this absolute rationality in thought and in conception, this is like a strong fundament for engineering works. Another experience was to see the bridges of Alexandra Sarazan. And I once assisted the doctoral thesis by an architect about the aesthetic of Sarazan's work. And he pointed out the figurative character of these bridges, as he called it. So in French, he made the opposition figurative effusionist. Just to illustrate, you can say this bridge in South Africa, nothing to do with Sarazan, this is figurative. You have an arch, you have the pillars, you have the deck. And all these parts are separate. They are like individuals. On the opposite, Maillard always melts things together. Here, the arch action is compound by the lower slab, the walls, the driving way. It's so-called interactive. Uh, every member of this bridge serves a multi-purpose function. So just as a concept, this is the opposite of the other. If you look at this railway bridge by Sarazan, and maybe at first case you can say this is <coughs> a little bit strange. Look at this line, this alignment for the railway. The railways go straight, but he runs down, then he goes up, then he makes a curve. Uh, look at these pillars in irregular sequence. In the background, uh, they are even not parallel because there is a road going on the side. Uh, and he could just place them better. I needed this concept of figurative thinking to better understand this assembly of individuals. And I thought Sarazin, being from the Wallis, he has, like the spirit of the builders of these bold Suonen water ways in this dry climate, and sometimes mm -hmm. they just had to go through horizontally. They had no other choice. And when you do such things, you don't care about parallel elements, mm. but you just want to do it in a way that works. And it happened that at the same time, there was in Zurich an exhibition about the work of the architects Heferi Moser Steiger. And in a certain way, I found the same spirit in this work especially the Congress House, which was an extension of an old historicist building with a modern, <coughs> new assembly hall. And these architects realized spaces of a very undogmatic <coughs> attitude. And I participated with Roger Diener in the competition of extension of this building, and we both were very affected by it. So in the mirrors, you can see the historicist part of the concert hall. But look, these radical modernists, how they use decorative elements, how they take together things which maybe you think they would not work together.
Yeah, maybe this comparison is a bit <laughs> personal, but well, it happened. And we discussed about this bridge because most people think this is really weak to add this kind of diagonals to such a large bridge. But I had to defend it because uh, I think this is Sarazin who combines these fragile bars of concrete and Again, you have these little shiftings, but if you are there for a long while, you start to understand the complex geometries of an arch rib and the curved driving way. And I mean, these pillars, they are not soldiers, they yeah. are individuals in the attitude of Sarazin. And I got <coughs> a new understanding of that kind of work. Uh, let me finish with an own bridge, which is also based on this concept of figurative uh, thinking. It's over the Ar River. It, it's a footbridge, and it was not possible or allowed to put pillars into the river. And also, they did not want to have a suspension bridge because ropes would be fatal traps for the birds. So it was only a stress ribbon bridge that finally worked. And we built three, a three span stress ribbon bridge. The middle span is about 80 meters. And we used these inclined concrete struts to shorten the span as far as possible. And also for getting a better longitudinal profile because the side spans, they go down. It was not necessary to uh, heighten the dance a lot with this concept. What you see is that the elements of this bridge are clearly articulated against <coughs> each other. You see the big hinges. Probably it's the first stress ridden bridge with hinges. We use these hinges to avoid fatigue stresses in the steel ribbons. And as these parts are moving, you cannot paint them. So it's stainless steel combined afterwards here with usual black steel. And there is an electric insulation in this joint to prevent the hole from corrosion. In a certain way, these hinges became the emblems of this bridge. And we only did dare to make this bridge so light because we wanted to introduce vibration dampers. But now we found out that these dampers are not necessary because maybe of these hinges, the users, the walkers coming along, they see ah, there will be something moving. And they are aware of that. And then it's not a problem. An interesting thing, which I was not aware of at the beginning, is that the bridge makes somehow the same thing as the trees around. The trees are also leaning to the water. And again, I think structural engineers should not imitate nature. But it happened that the trees look for the light, and the bridge wants to shorten its spans. And this led somehow to the almost the same reaction on the landscape. So I uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jörg. So hopefully there'll be some, uh, some questions. Uh, I don't know who wants to start. I think that, that one thing that I, I failed to mention at the beginning is that, uh, that Jörg, before um, Starting his own practice, you you worked for like seven years or something together uh, with, uh, with Peter Zumthor, and uh, where you were doing engineering but also architecture, and somehow there was also this kind of fusion for you to some degree between the the architectural issues and engineering issues. I think it might be interesting to for everybody to hear 
how, how did this experience actually change you as a structural engineer when you started doing your work? What did you gain from this experience of working for seven years together with, uh, with Zomtor? Yeah, when I finished my studies, I was well trained in technological knowledge, in calculating structures, but during engineering studies in the 1970s in Zurich, you never talked about designing structures. <coughs> it was just something which was given to you as a problem to solve, and uh, I felt this is a this was a great loss or a missing thing, and so yeah, I started as a practitioner in Zumthor's office. I remember he. I learned to know him about some friends where he made a little transformation of an apartment in, in the old town of Kur. And he, he just had founded his own office. And we were together one evening, and I thought, this is, seems to be an interesting person. And I asked him if I could work with him as a practitioner. I said, oh, you're an engineer. I have no need for an engineer. <laughs> Let's do it like that. I just come and after a month we <coughs> discuss about money and about going on with this. And so this was the start of, of these seven years working there. And as I said, the office was very small. So we had a draftsman, then two, so four, five persons. And so you realize everything that happens. And for me, it was like an extension of my education as an engineer uh, in a way that still today I think the methods of an architect can be very fruitful to an engineer. And vice versa, too, of course. But architects, they usually learn some basics about engineering. But on the other hand, this still happens in a very small way, I think. And so for me, this was an important experience to learn how one can conceive a building, which, as I said, is not so different from conceiving a structure. Mm -hmm. the, the one other <coughs> thing is maybe about the question of uh, precedence. I know also precedence, you're very interested in precedence. Yesterday we were saying that, you know, with the Swiss Pavilion, because it was the Swiss Pavilion, they kind of focused on everything being Swiss. Um, but I know also Jörg is really, you're very interested in, in, in a whole array of things that go outside of Switzerland. And so when we were also working together, you were very keen on, for example, Brunel and the influences of many, many people. How, how do you think, what's the relevance for you of precedent? in terms of the way you work. I'm, I'm, I'm actually very interested in the, in the phenomenon of the topic of precedent. Mm -hmm. as a, you know, how do we relate to, to, to precedent? How does it work for you? I think this was like the first thing in my professional life. But yeah, as a boy or as, as a young man, I liked certain things around me. I liked this kind of bridges and I wanted to know how this works. I wanted to do similar things. And this was the main motivation to study engineering. It was not because I was a good mathematician or so. It was the opposite. I learned that aha, uh -huh, mathematics are good for doing such things. So I have to learn mathematics and I was mo motivated to do that. But the first thing was the immediate experience of the built environment. And I think still this is something I like <laughs> so much. Walk around, looking at things, thinking about that, and then doing similar things. That's yeah. somehow not so complicated. <laughs> That's no, but just I think you're also, also interested in the idea of the contemporaneity of precedent. The idea that the precedent is not just something that is old and it's in the history, but that you somehow make the precedent alive. In architecture, mm -hmm. when people sometimes refer to precedent, they copy something. 
and you have the image of something, so it's the association. But in engineering, you are interested in the principles of certain things, it seems, and, and, and how you've dealt with that is interesting. I mean, you, you've done a lot of bridges. You didn't show many of these previous bridges, um, so I think that, that relationship to what had happened, where you got the inspiration from, in a way, is a kind of interesting phenomenon. But anyway, maybe we'll just uh, see if there are any comments or questions. John, we're very lucky that you're here. Do you, do you have any observations? Well, John happy. Oxendorf, who's a <coughs> wonderful engineer at MIT. I brought a MIT. class of students from MIT, and they ate all the food, so if you didn't eat it, that's <laughs> I noticed you didn't have anything, so I, yeah. um, York, it's absolutely wonderful to have you back. And, and I just would um, maybe ask you to, to talk a little bit more about education broadly. I mean, for example, as engineers, we're really not taught to draw today. So where did you learn to draw? And if you were to, to start over, start from scratch and invent a program where you had engineers and architects working together, learning what are the basic skills of a designer, what would that program look like? There are very few places in the world where that happens. But, uh, but we could agree there are certain uh, skills that a designer should have. So, mm -hmm. so I'd just like to ask you about, about that problem in education. Now maybe this is a bit dangerous, what I say now, but often I have the impression you start too early to design things in an architectural program. <laughs> <laughs> but how can you collaborate with an engineer when you don't know enough about basics. Maybe the system as it is in the education of engineering is not so bad that you focus first on, on a solid craftsmanship. But I think at the same time it would be not a problem also for first semester students to, <coughs> to go, to look, to learn about collaboration, to see what happened in between Louis Kahn and August Commandant, how they worked together, who told what to whom. I think this way of, of learning, just of stocking uh, information, that's something that is not uh, dependent on what you have learned yourself already, that you can do at any, thi any time. But then I think gradually out of this could come the, the desire to make things no. oneself. But often I have to, uh, I did, uh, when I go as a critique in an architectural school, uh, oh, how difficult is the task they have to do? I would be completely at uh, loose He was looking myself. at the third semester core studios yesterday. <laughs> 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 so this is fresh on his mind. He'd be there so this is a rather general remark. Right. So. Right. Uh, right. Well, we take things very personally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but this is something that uh, also yesterday that I'm wondering why do the students not look how somebody else has solved that problem. I usually work like that. I look around. How can this be done? How has this been done? And then I look closer and say, oh, yeah, that's very convincing. And maybe this thing could be done a little bit different. Uh, but to build up on the <coughs> experience which exists. I think is a reasonable way of, of working and I'm not pressed for novelty or for creativity at all. I think this is something that just has to come when it's needed, but not as a problem. <laughs> so, 
Any other comments or please? Uh, it seems like uh, if the trend in structural engineering history has been for less and less material, less and less uh, uh, structure to do the same job as before, um, as uh, almost as if the ideal structure was, you know, the material is getting thinner and thinner to where the point it disappears, and the ideal bridge maybe would be one just carried by air. Um, why? Why do you think this obsession for lightness is this something that you also subscribe to, and do you believe that? Uh, that is the goal of uh, structural engineering. And maybe to frame my question, I'd like to point out some of the earlier examples you show that are in fact extremely massive, heavy bridges that are incredible and just as powerful as maybe light ones. Yeah, it was the intention to show two extreme examples of my own work today. Uh, so in the last bridge, it just proved to be reasonable to make it as light as possible. Because stress ribbon bridge, you have to anchor, and the anchor are expensive and so I tried to minimize the loss there but in falls it was the opposite uh, it was just natural to use the stone there of course it was more expensive it cost about 1 million 300 thousand Swiss francs instead of 1 million for a usual concrete frame this is not such out of proportion I think uh, mm -hmm. and I mean, we have this tradition also of the stone bridges of the railways around 1900. I mean, when you build in stone, it is heavy, but it also has this tension about a relative lightness. I often feel when you look at the pillars of these stone bridges, you see that also these things are somehow taken to the rational limits. And this gives you a certain interest in that. Of course, engineering is about minimizing something and maximizing something else. But apart from that, I think you should deal with any material. And I mean, I like the work of Schleich. Very good, but he's like the prophet of lightness and sustainability with less material. But it's also sustainable to use the material which is at a certain place. But then it's not a question of lightness. So I think there we have to be very open. And for me, the, the notion of the bridge as a house, this was new. This was an experience I made with the photographer this spring, and when you look at the house, you don't feel bad if there is a beam which is one-fifth of its span. Uh, so I think this can give you a certain freedom of, of design if you consider the bridge not only as something very sporting, Hi. You mentioned uh, two different sort of figurative expressions in the bridges. One is where certain collections of elements uh, stand, uh, express themselves as discrete uh, collections where you know, different types of elements sort of stand next to each other but they don't blend together. And then you also showed bridges that you talked about, it's sort of the parts that are melting together. And I was wondering if you could talk more about that. I, I feel maybe embedded within that is like the contrast, say, between like columns and a lintel versus an arch. And, and then um, how did those re respond to the landscape around it? How did one get called into action by the landscape <coughs> versus the other one? What brings them into being and why? I think it's just two different ways of maybe thinking, which I have not seen so clear before, this distinction between a melting concept and 
you know, something discreet, figurative. And I just can say this, it's interesting to see different definitions of how you can perceive it. This is not uh, valutation. It's not to say that something is better than the other. But in certain cases, maybe the one is more appropriate than the other. And perhaps the discrete way of conceiving things is more related to materials like wood, steel, and the other is more stone. But as you see in the concrete yet, you can have both attitudes. And what was interesting for me is that I, I studied a lot of the bridges of Christian Men. And he always said, try to unify all the parts of the bridge, to have the same section in the deck, as in the pillars, as in the arch. And this, and Sarazen, he doesn't care anything about that. He combined mushroom decks with arch ribs. Uh, he's like a bit anarchist. And I felt maybe you end with a certain kind of formalism if you always look at things as one whole piece. And it can be interesting to give the members of a structure a certain freedom. It was just that theoretical uh, insight that made me, that created an interest for the works of Sarazan. Because I think he's really an individual also in the landscape of, of engineers in Switzerland. And he's, he's worth to be studied more in detail, closer, uh, just by this maybe the strange feelings you have at first gaze when you have these seemingly inconsistent elements. Perhaps you wouldn't have said that 10 years ago. No. I think that's, that's <laughs> yeah. a more recent, uh, you're yeah. having been contaminated by uh, too many architects. Um, <laughs> but this, I think, is actually related to what John was saying about the nature of education and the influence of one on the other. And you mentioned, uh, you know, Commandant and, and Khan. And the other day you were saying that, and I think somebody else also said it, is that there's so much emphasis on just, like, the role of the engineer as enabling whatever the architect wants to do. So we can do we can do anything. Anything is possible. Um, and yet, and yet, no, no, hold on. And yet there is the idea <laughs> that um, you don't really want to do that. You want to introduce a different sense of this kind of uh, rationality, uh, the appropriateness, maybe it's a better word than rationality, into that conversation so that it shouldn't be about doing whatever. Uh, in some way, so what if, I mean, like continuing that idea of, of of education, the way one works. How do you? How would you characterize that? What is it that you want architects to be more uh, cognizant of, to be more sensitive about in that in that relationship, in the way that they imagine, and in the way that you, as an engineer, respond to their work? Excuse me, I would like to add still, something to the first <laughs> okay. thing because uh, yeah, I lost it. <laughs> so Sometimes you you stand before the construction and you you know you have to maybe you have to decide whether it will stand or you tear it down. So you need to decide about the value of a thing. And I always try to find qualities. And sometimes it's different, or it's a long process to find qualities. And I remember that Bruno Reichling once gave me some sketches of uh, Jean Prouvé. And he wanted to have a comment of the structural point of view about these sketches. And I saw these sketches and said, he was fooled. It's, <laughs> it's just a roof, a thing, post, 
another thing post and a very heavy inclined element. It makes absolutely no sense. Why can yeah I, I had a problem. I cannot write down uh, prove it was stupid. <laughs> so, so I had I was forced to, to try to understand it and then after a while, I, I came to the idea that Prouvé is not like me thinking about snow, about vertical loads. He builds in the desert. He has the problem of stability. He has the problem of wind. His forces are horizontal. He builds such light buildings that every window frame carries the vertical load. That's absolutely no problem for him. And when I knew that for Prouvé, the horizontal actions are the most important, then I started to understand him, because then it was not absolute anymore what he sketched. So it was my problem, not his. Yeah. Uh, and to detect that, <coughs> and I mean, this is necessary to, to find out what is the quality, what is the way somebody uh, ticks But this is also the, an interesting aspect of, of research. Which is that in engineering, there's no fixed rationality, that you're saying the rationality is actually situational or mm -hmm. cir circumstantial, because the <coughs> circumstances can influence issues of lightness and heaviness and appropriateness of the structure. But what about my question? OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I expect from an architect? Mm -hmm. Curiosity and respect. <laughs> <laughs> Which you always get, yeah? No. <laughs> no, no, I, uh, I could tell about examples where the, let's say, the formal will of an architect was bigger than his ability to integrate <coughs> structural thinking and then it doesn't work to collaborate. But I mean there was somebody like Livio Vacchini who always said uh, his buildings are very structural, I think. He always said, I don't know nothing about structures. And that's my force. I have a certain naivety to against structural questions. Maybe this is not the thing you should take too literally, but <laughs> maybe this was like a quality of him to to have a very a certain openness towards that. But finally he always ended up with very disciplined structural projects. So it's not, no. I think usually it's a process that you try to sit together and to find a good solution in a repeated discussion. And that, that needs an openness on both sides, or just a willingness to let things develop in a way maybe which you don't foresee at the start. Mm -hmm. Can we also have a question from one of the MIT students who had lunch? <laughs> Just, uh, <laughs> I actually have um, a two-part question. Um, one is about the bridge as um, an object that just doesn't connect you know, A to B, but also um, as, as an idea of symmetry. So I, I was wondering how we can is, is that structural engineer's decision to introduce all these other elements to design and bridge or other things? And also, you mentioned um, that structural engineers should not look at nature to design, and architects nowadays look at nature very closely to uh, come up with new ideas of design and pattern, etc. So why not look at design? you guys, and two, when you work with an architect who does, what do you do? What was the last sentence? Last question? Yeah. Uh, nature. 
<laughs> no, no, but no, she's but saying that, that uh, actually that's a better question for him to answer than the first part. But I think it's more clear. But the, no, no, I mean, it's just because of time and all that. So she's asking about the fact that you said uh, we shouldn't, uh, engineers shouldn't look at nature to design engineering. I don't, I don't know if you said that. Yeah, no. But anyway, <laughs> and, but that she, yeah, what, what, yeah. but what architects do is that they are looking more mm -hmm. at, at nature. And so what do you think about that? And also if you are now working with an architect yeah. who's looking at nature, so they bring you something kind of naturalistic uh, of sorts, what is your reaction to that collaboration, right? Something, yeah. something like that. No, I did not say you should not look at nature, of course. You should not imitate nature. That should not imitate nature. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a reaction on some tendencies to, uh, let's say, the notion of tree posts. I don't know if you have that here, but a tree usually is not nature has not made the tree to support anything above it. So uh, this is a bit a strange image for me to say, OK, take a tree as an example of a very efficient uh, thing. So I, I prefer to, yeah, to talk about the real discipline of structural engineering with its own tradition and its own way of explaining efficient ways of dealing with forces. It's just uh, sometimes you have to, uh, the idea that engineers don't trust the force of their own past. They want to be become a little bit greenish and say, oh, we are all together <laughs> in nature. That's Maybe that's only a bit of a superficial tendency sometimes. Of course, you have to have a, a very close look at nature. And just uh, keep in mind that when I make a survey of a building site, uh, I really take in account every tree and uh, every stone, uh, which has its meaning on the building site. So in that way, nature, uh, of course, as the surrounding, has to be taken in any design, but it's not that uh, I like a uh, facade which has like this tree-like uh, figures, which I think is, is a, a rather uninteresting formalism. Uh, I hope I could clarify that a little bit. What was the second thing? She was asking if you are working with an architect mm -hmm. who's using that, what would be your Response. Presumably, you'll try to convince them to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. <Okay. laughs> or let's say, no. At least, sometimes you can find like a double meaning. I mean, there are things which can be, at the same time, very structural and very expressive on a totally different thing. Yeah. Like my last example, I could have presented that as looking at nature and say, I make the same thing like these trees. Well, you would not have opposed to that. But it just was not the case. And in a way, I'm happy if such things just, just happen without uh, a certain intention. But there is a story when in 1800, when Escher built the canal for the Lind River, which was a big undertaking at its time, uh, nobody was sh he wanted to, to make dry a, a big plain. And nobody was sure if this really would be successful. And he was under constant critique. And after some years, uh, he came to a site where he found out that he dug in an old riverbed. And then this was like a triumphant moment for him. He said, look, the river was here once. I do the right thing. I have understood nature. And these are maybe moments when it happens that 
different tendencies come together. But these are like uh, happy moments. Maybe you can't always you know, take this in, in account from the start. Did you want to ask your first part of your... It's, it's okay. I think you should have... Understood. But you can think about it if you want to say it. I, it's just that I lost, I lost, <laughs> I lost it. So, um, anybody from this side? This side is very quiet. <laughs> what is happening? Do you have any questions? You're, you, you, you seem like ready. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yes, I thought, it, I thought the, the can fact you, that you Can you just the wait for the mic? Right. Sorry, so that we can hear you. Yeah, I, I, I thought the, uh, the the fact that you pointed out the way in which the, the hinge on the bridge sort of acted like a signal, sort of telling people, oh, the bridge is going to move a bit. And um, sort of the response was that people were more comfortable with the bridge moving more. Um, I just thought that was a really interesting phenomenon. And I was wondering if you knew of any sort of precedence, um, either in the tradition of, of structural engineering or in your own work, in which that kind of signal was used intentionally, or if you had any thoughts on, on um, sort of the potentials of, of, of that sort of signal and, and sort of changing people's comfort levels with mm -hmm. Yeah, to admit that also in this case, uh, I started with this fatigue problem, and, and it was very simplified by the hinge. So that was the start, and only then I realized that this could have uh, a good psychological effect on the users. And then as I also thought like the, the turbine hall of Behrens in Berlin, where you have these hinges half exposed to, to the outside. And in a way, I think these points are always fascinating to have elements of movement in a structure is in a way such a strange thing and it, it makes you think about uh, the structure as a vivid thing so maybe automatically this, this gives a concentration of your attention to these points and I remember Rino Tami in his or he was an architect in Tessin who dealt a lot with highway building there, and he always insisted on the bridges that the hinges are made of steel cylinders and not these Teflon coated uh, hidden things. He wanted to express the hinges. And uh, I can very well understand that. Jörg, thank you very, very much for really a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.